Hey, what's going on, everyone? Um, today, I want to discuss with you uh, my favorite passages from the book White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo and Michael Eric Dyson. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a pretty deep book. Uh, highly recommend it for anyone who's into uh, equality and wants to learn a little bit more about this topic that can be uncomfortable for many. But um, I really have enjoyed it. The book is called White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism by Robin D'Angelo. D'Angelo. So I'm going to read to you my favorite passages and just reflect on the book so far. Um, I've only made it um, maybe 30% 30, 30 of the way through, but have been so compelled to talk about it because I think it's, it's a fascinating topic. Uh, let me know what you all think. Whiteness is a fiction. What, what in the jargon of the academy is termed a social co construct and an agreed upon myth that has empirical grit because of its effect, not its essence. But whiteness goes even one better. It's a category of, of identity that's most useful when it's, its very existence is denied. Identity politics. The United States was founded on the principle that all people are created equal, yet the nation began with the attempted genocide of indigenous people and the theft of their land. American wealth has, was built on the labor of kidnapped and enslaved Africans and their descendants. Women were denied the right to vote until 1920, and the black women and black women were denied access to their right until 1965, which, which isn't that long ago. It's crazy to think that. The term identity politics refers to the focus on the barriers specific groups face in their struggle for equality. We have yet to achieve our, our founding principle, but any gains we've made thus far have come through identi identity politics. The decisions made at those tables affect the lives of those not at the table. Inclusion at those tables doesn't de depend on will willful intent. We don't have to intend to exclude for the results of our action to be inclusion. While implicit bias is always at play because if humans have bias, inequality can incur simply due homogeneity. And if I'm not aware of the barriers you face, then I won't see them, much less be motivated to remove them, nor will I be motivated to remove the barriers if they provide an advantage in which I feel entitled. That's a good point. I think if you're someone who benefits from this, you know, in this particular example, um, we'll just say white people, then why would you want change, right? You can, you can say, oh, I'm... I'm black. I'm for Black Lives Matter or whatever. But at the end of the day, if you're doing nothing, that's because inherently you're benefiting from this injustice, right? I think the the concept around that is that people think that um, there's a scarcity context that they think, well, if you win, then I lose. Well, in this case, that's not always the case, right? You we can create a win-win. So I thought that was a very interesting quote. So she says, I'm using my insider status to challenge racism, to use my position to, this way to uphold racism, that it's unacceptable, that it's a both and that I must live with. And we would never suggest that mine is the only voice that should be heard, only that it's one of the many pieces needed to solve the overall puzzle. People who do not identify as white may also find this book helpful for understanding why it is so often difficult to talk to white people about racism. Multiracial people, because they challenge racial constructs and boundaries, face unique challenges in the society in which racial categories have profound meanings. Meaning, the dominant society will assign them a racial identity, a racial identity, and may not align with the assigned identity. For example, Though the Bob um, musician Bob Marley was multiracial, society perceived him as black and thus responded to him as he were black. When multiracial people, uh, people's racial identity is ambiguous, they will, fee they will face constant pressure to explain themselves and choose a side. Racial identity for multiracial people is further complicated by the racial identity of their parents and the, and the racial demographic 
demographics of the community in which they are raised. Yeah, this is a very interesting topic uh, for people who are multiracial. I know a lot of, uh, for instance, Asians. Um, in, I was part of an Asian fraternity, and there were people who were mixed race, and they would always talk about how difficult it was that they had, they felt like they had to choose a side. And you know, it's an interesting concept where you're not accepted from both sides, and you know, you you kind of have to pick and choose. You know, I, I heard stories about my friends who are half black, half white. And, you know, because of the Black Lives Matter movement, they felt like they had to choose a side. So I I found that fascinating. So while white people in North America live in a society that's deeply separate and unequal by race, and, and white people are the beneficiaries of that separation and inequality, As a result, we are insinuated from racial stress at the same time that we come to feel entitled to and the observing of advantage. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that speaks for itself. For example, many white participants who live in white suburban neighborhoods and have had no sustained relationships with people of color were absolutely certain that they had no racial prejudice or animosity. Also uh, speaks for itself. I am, I am a white American raised in the United States and I have a white frame of reference and a white worldview and I moved through a world with a white experience. My experience is not a universal human experience. It's particularly, it is a particularly white experience in society, in a society which race matters profoundly, a society that is deeply separate and unequal by race. However, like most white people raised in the U.S., I was not taught to see myself in racial terms and certainly not to draw attention to my race or to behave as it mattered in any way. Mm. This part really, really touched me, actually, what she said. She said, of course, I was made aware that somebody's race mattered, and if race was discussed, it would be theirs, not mine. Yet a critical component of cross-racial skill building is the ability to sit with the discomfort of, of being seen racially, of having to proceed as if our race matters, which it does. Being seen racially is a common trigger for white of white fragility and thus to build our stamina white people must face the first challenge naming our race i can get through she she talks about how she so she talks about i can get through graduate school without ever discussing race i I can graduate from law school and even without even discussing racism i can get through a teacher education program without ever discussing racism. If I'm in a program considered progressive, I might have a single required diversity course. A handful of faculty have fought for years to get me me this course, likely having to overcome resistance from the majority of their white colleagues and will still be fighting to keep the course. In this diversity course, we might read ethnic authors and learn about heroes and heroines from various groups of colors, but there's no guarantee we'll discuss racism. Damn, that is kind of crazy to think, right? Like you can graduate from law school and become a lawyer or be a teacher and professor where you influence literally hundreds or thousands of students over the course of your lifetime and still not be required to have a course about racism. That is fucking mind blowing for me. (laughs) That's crazy. But but exploring these cultural frameworks can be particularly challenging in Western culture, precisely because of two key Western ideologies, individualism and objectivity. Briefly, individualism holds that we are each unique and stand apart from, from others, even with those in our social group. Objectively tells us... Uh, Objectivity tells us it's possible to be free of all bias. These ideologies make it very difficult for white people to explore the collective aspects of the white experience. Individualism is a storyline that creates, communicates, reproduces, and reinforces the concept that each of us is a unique individual, that our group memberships, such as race, class, or gender, are irrelevant to our opportunities. Individualism claims that there's no intrinsic barriers to individual success, 
And failure is not a consequence of social structures, but comes from individual character. This is a very interesting topic. That's a good point, right? Because I think a lot of times we're taught to, to be empowered. And yes, I get it. Like, don't be a victim. But 50% of it is still systematic, right? Like, if you're in a system that's essentially screwing you over, um, yeah, you could be the most empowering. You could read the most books. And you could do all these great things. But at the end of the day, like, you're still getting shot in the foot, right? It's like starting the race, um, like, 20, 30 meters behind while your your counterparts are starting at the at the one meter line you're already starting 30 me- meters behind yes you could win the race but it's going to be a hard race for you to win so yeah this this book so the racial status quo is comfortable for white people and will will not move forward in race relations if we remain comfortable Basically, we're saying that this this conversation is not always the most comfortable conversation, but that's how change happens when we actually acknowledge and deal with things instead of shoving it underneath the rug and then one day we'll have to deal, deal with it. The key to moving forward is what we do with our discomfort. We can use it as a door out, blame the messenger and disregard the message, or we can use it as a door in by asking, why does this unsettle me? What does it mean for me if this were true? How does this lens change my understanding of racial dynamics? How, how can my unease help reveal the unexamined assumptions I've been making? Is it possible that because I'm white, there are some racial dynamics I can't see? Am I willing to consider that, poss- that possibility? Am I willing to do so? Then why not? Or if I, if I'm not willing to do so, then why not? Still, although working class whites experience classism, they aren't explain, they, they aren't also experiencing racism. I grew up in poverty and felt a deep sense of shame about being poor, but I also knew that I was white and that was better to be white. Prejudice is foundational to understanding white fragility because it's suggesting that white people have racial prejudice is perceived as saying that we're bad and should be ashamed. Then we feel the need to defend our our character rather than explore the inevitable racial prejudice we have absorbed so that we might change them. In this way, our misunderstandings about prejudice is what protects it. Hmm. In a society, what? In a society-wide dynamic that's a, that occurs at the group level, when I say that only whites can be racist, I mean that in the United States, only whites have the collective, social, and institutional power and privilege over people of color. People of color do not have this power and privilege over white people. Many whites see racism as a thing of the past, and of course, we are well served not to acknowledge it in the present. Yet, racial disparity between whites and people of color continues to exist in every institution across society, in many cases increasing rather than decreasing. Though segregation may make these disparities difficult for whites to see and easy to deny, racial disparities and their effects on overall quality of life have, has been intent- extensively documented by a wide range of agencies. Among those documenting these challenges are the U.S. Census Bureau, the United Nations, academic groups as, such as the UCLA Civil Rights Project and the Metropolis Project and nonprofits such as NAACP and the Anti-Deformation League. Whiteness is not acknowledged by white people and the white reference point is assumed to be universal and, and is imposed on everyone. White people find it very difficult to think about whiteness as a specific state of being that could have an impact on one's life and perceptions. In an example, uh, in 1946, a, white, uh, a French reporter asked expatriate writer Richard White his thoughts on the Negro problem in the, in the United States. Wright replied, there isn't any Negro problem, there's only a white problem. Imagine if instead the story went on like this. Jackie Robinson, the first black man whites allowed to play in, in Major League Baseball. This version makes a critical dis- 
uh, distinction because no matter how fantastic a player Robinson was, he could not play in the major leagues if whites who controlled the institution did not allow it. Whites control all major institutions of societies and set the policies and practices that others may live by. Although rare individual people of color may be inside circles of power, Colin Powell, Clarence Thomas, Marco Rubio, Barack Obama, they support the status quo and do not challenge racism in any significant enough to be threatening. Their powers, positions of power do not mean that these public figures do not experience racism. Obama endures insults and resistance previously unheard of, but the status quo remains intact. So I want to leave you with this part, which was the most eye-opening, which I knew already, but when you put it in stats, it's always, you know, resonates more. So this book was written in 2000 and between 2016, 2017, right? So if you're reading this you know, 100 years later, obviously it's going to be different, but. So. Ten, the 10 richest Americans, 100% white. Seven of them are, are, are among the 10 richest in the world. The U.S. Congress is 90% white. U, the U.S. governors, 96% white. Top military advisors, 100% white. President and vice president, 100% white. U.S. Free uh, House of Freedom Caucus, 99% white. Current U.S. presidential cabinet, 91% white. People who decide which TV shows we see, 93% white. People who decide which books we read, 90% white. People who decide which music is produced, 95% white. People who di directed a 100 top grossing films of all time, 95% white. Teachers, 82% white. Full-time college professors, 84% white. Owners of men's professional football teams, 97% white. Well, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Um, let me know what your thoughts are. And cheers. I hope this helped you think a little bit differently. My reflection on this is like from, from reading these types of books and being engaged in this conversation, I become much more knowledgeable and I bring light into something that many are very afraid to speak of. Cheers.